So let's begin our webinar. <laughs> Hello, everyone. How are you? This is Audi from Wisonic Medical in China. Welcome all the new and old friends to join the 18th global webinar of Wisonic Dandelion College. Wisonic Dandelion College is a free online platform for the purpose of sharing the cutting edge know-how and insights of point of care ultrasound applications with global professionals and medical practitioners. Today, we are much honored to invite Dr. Amjad Mania from India as our webinar speaker uh, to share his valuable experience of ultrasound blocks for analgesia of the chest wall. Meanwhile, we are also much honored to invite Dr. Ramuchi Kokani as our moderate. Today's webinar will be divided into two major sessions. The first session is uh, the speech by Dr. Amjad, and the second session will be Q&A. So, welcome you all to raise your questions and uh, further communicate with the Dr. Amjad during Q&A sessions. Now, please allow me to give you a brief introduction of our webinar moderator, Dr. Ramuti. Dr. Ramuti Kukani, he studied anesthesiology at Father Muller Medical College, India, and awarded as Doctor of Medicine degree in 2012. He passed FIPP Fellow in Interventional Pain Practice from World Institute of Pain at Budapest, Hungary in 2016. He passed EDRA, European Diploma of Regional Anesthesia in 2019. He is the executive committee member of AORA, Academy of Regional Anesthesia India. He is the membership of India Medical Association. He is also the membership of Indian Society of Anesthesiologists. He is also the membership of Indian Society for Study of Pain. He has published many regional articles about regional anesthesia and the pain management at International Journal of Science and Research, as well as Indian Journal of Research. He is currently working as consultant in anesthesia and pain management at Oxon Anesthesia Associates, Bangalore, India. Okay, so let's welcome Dr. Ramuti. Please, Dr. Ramuti. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Audi, for the introduction. Um, uh, uh, good evening, everyone, for the today's webinar. Uh, let me introduce today's uh, resource person, uh, Dr. Amjad Maniar. Yeah. Hope, hope you can see the slide. Yes. Uh, Dr. Amjad Mayar is uh, uh, doesn't need any introduction uh, because he is a well-known uh, anesthesiologist in the, in the field of regional anesthesia across the world. Uh, he is a consultant anesthesiologist at uh, Axon Anesthesia Associates, uh, Bangalore. He studied his uh, MD anesthesiology at uh, MSI Medical College uh, in Bangalore, and uh, he completed his fellowship in regional anesthesia at uh, Kotec Tuat Hospital in Singapore in the year 2012. He is an editorial board member of AORA India Academy of Regional Anesthesia, and he's a scientific committee member of AORA India, and he is also the fellowship coordinator for AORA Sonocyte Fellowship, which is done every year in India, and recently, he has developed a aerosol box for uh, uh, the intubations uh, and uh, to prevent the anesthesiologist uh, 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 from 
from the aerosol that has been generated during the anesthesia procedures from the patients during the covid-19 pandemic and it, it has been popular and is being used in india also in other countries as well and in the past years he has been constantly involved in teaching and training and he has uh, various workshops at national and international level in various countries not only in india but also in other countries like singapore philippines south africa australia and indonesia he has few publications and uh, international journals so today's topic is very very important uh that is chest wall anesthesia some guided our blogs for chest wall anesthesia uh there are array of options for providing chest wall anesthesia we have various uh special pain blocks right from thoracic vertebral to the anterior transverse thoracic pain block we have multiple options for uh, uh chest wall anesthesia these blocks are being used um in, in the off room for uh, providing post op anesthesia of the thoracic as the surgeries uh also in the i to provide anesthesia fractures and uh, intercostal drains uh nursing for the intercostal drains and also uh, these blocks have been used in uh, chronic pain management as well uh, for uh, uh, management of uh, thoracotomy pain syndromes okay thank you <laughs> Where is Dr. Ramuti? Yeah. Post uh and post mastectomy pain and uh some of these uh blocks are being used even for uh, intercostal uh, neuralgias then post herpetic neuralgias um uh, and even my facial pain syndromes arising from the pectoral muscles. So though, though though we have a wide variety of options uh, for providing the chest wall analgesia the evidence is still lacking for the newer uh, blocks and there is always a uh, doubt and confusion uh, as to which uh, block is better to provide chest wall analgesia uh, compared to others so to clear all our doubts and to throw a light on uh, these chest wall blocks we have dr amjad maniar uh, today uh, and i will uh, uh hand over the session to dr amjad maniar to proceed with the uh, his lecture and i request all the participants all the viewers to mute themselves so that they can listen to the webinar very clearly you can drop your questions in the q and a session q and a section and all these questions maximum number of questions will be taken at the end of the uh, lecture thank you over to dr amjad maniar Okay. Thank you, Dr. Ram, for that uh, introduction. Uh, my greetings to the team at West Wisonic, or the in particular, for giving me this opportunity to share a little bit of my knowledge with you today. So I will just start the the webinar now, and we'll. Very good evening to everyone, and welcome to this webinar on the ultrasound guided blocks. for analgesia of the chest wall in my disclosure i would like to mention that i have received a honorarium from bisonic medical for this talk but that should in no way influence the content well we all know that surgeries procedures and any trauma to the chest wall are excruciatingly painful and historically when you wanted analgesia of the chest you would perhaps go to the most reliable technique placing an epidural catheter but you and i know that epidural catheters in the thoracic region can be challenging and are also fraught with complications so there are some popular ultrasound guided techniques that have emerged in the last couple of years and these make for very good alternatives in providing analgesia to the thorax When we look to the trunk it is always very practical to divide it into zones the uppermost zone is the thorax and the abdomen can be divided into two parts the upper abdomen and the lower abdomen 
Today's lecture we will concentrate on the thorax and maybe we can deal with the abdomen at some other time. It is very important to understand the dermatomal supply of the trunk when we are trying to provide anesthesia and analgesia to this part. If you look at this map, you can see that the predominant supply is from T2 to T6 when we are talking about the thorax. Below that, we are into the zone of the abdomen, which is also actually supplied from nerves that emanate from the thoracic spine. When it comes to providing analgesia for the thorax, there often is a little bit of confusion that goes around. Over the years, the thoracic epidural has been the go-to intervention to provide analgesia for the thorax. Some of the more adventurous and enthusiastic anesthesiologists would try the paravertebral block, sometimes the intercostal blocks. Most of the current techniques that we use these days are very new. In fact, they're not more than 10 years old. Some of the techniques are purely ultrasound based. They are facial plane blocks and some are conversions or interpretations of the landmark technique into ultrasound technique. There's also some reverse engineering that goes on every now and then where these ultrasound guided techniques are being converted to landmark techniques. And of course, we have all faced this. There's a lot of over enthusiasm to name a block these days. And this has resulted in multiple names for the same block, for the same concepts, as well as sometimes the same block being renamed. So in today's webinar, we're going to look at some concepts of thoracic innovation. I believe that once you understand what you're trying to block, the names and the techniques of the blocks should not matter so much. More specifically, we'll go into the paravertebral block in detail. We'll look at the intercostal blocks. We'll look at two blocks that are fairly simple to execute and have gained in popularity for many years now, the pectoral block and the serratus plane block. And we'll also look at that flavor of the season for the last two seasons, if you may, the erector spinae block. Just a little bit on it, not too much. Now, if you're willing to look beyond the thoracic epidural for options for analgesia, you open up a huge bunch of blocks that are available at your disposal in today's practice. Uh, I'm not sure if such a huge list is uh, actually useful or it's intimidating to somebody who's trying to start off in regional anesthesia, but fortunately or unfortunately, this is what we have today. Among the most popular are the pectoral blocks and its evolution, the serratus plane block. Both of these like most of the others are facial plane blocks. They are attributed to their discoverer, Dr. Rafael Blanco. And a further evolution, and the most popular of them these days, is the erector spinae plane block. There are some variations that are close, probably close cousins of the erector spinae plane block, like the mid transverse process to pleura block. Uh, but more or less for traditional regional anesthesiologists like me, the gold standard for thoracic analgesia remains the paravertebral block, which I'll be talking to you about in most of this lecture. Some of the other options are nice to read about, but you'll have to look at it closely and see if that they will suit the kind of practice that you are involved in. Now, if you want to remember just one or two slides from the entire webinar today. It would be this one and perhaps the next slide. So it's very important before you decide to put local and anesthetic somewhere that you understand where you're putting it and to what structure are you putting it and what the functional outcome of your act is. So for that, you'll have to understand what these nerves are that supply the thorax. So this is representative of a vertebral level and we'll try to describe what a typical thoracic intercostal nerve looks like. 
So this is the vertebral body that you see there, two transverse processes, a spinous process, and this is the spinal cord that you see there. From the dorsal and the ventral horn emanate the dorsal and ventral branch of the nerve, which together unite to form the spinal nerve. Now, on the dorsal branch will lie the dorsal root ganglion. If you're a chronic pain specialist, this is an area of interest for you. And somewhere in the vicinity, we are very close to the sympathetic chain. Now, the spinal nerve that comes out throws off an immediate dorsal branch that, uh, that heads towards the erector spinae muscle, goes through it, and forms two superficial branches there which supply the skin over the back. But the main nerve is the ventral branch or the anterior branch which courses the entire uh, hemithorax. The ventral branch or the anterior branch somewhere in the middle throws off a lateral branch and this is also of a lot of significance. The lateral branch supplies the skin over the lateral wall of the chest. The anterior branch tends to supply more of the anterior area of the chest. This entire nerve is encased in various layers of muscles. And if you were to know, the, there are three layers of muscles that the thoracic uh, intercostal nerves is sandwiched in. It is the, this is the external intercostal muscle, this is the internal intercostal muscle and what you see right here is the innermost intercostal muscle. So the thoracic intercostal nerve actually lies between the internal intercostal muscle and the innermost intercostal muscle. This is very similar to how the neural structures are arranged in the abdomen. Many of you are very familiar with how the tap block is done. You know that the tap block again has three layers of muscles, the external oblique, the internal oblique, and the transversus abdominis. And the neural plane is that between the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis. It's a similar concept that you can keep in mind that the plane where the thoracic intercostal nerve lies is between these two muscles the internal intercostal and the innermost intercostal muscle. So now that you know how this nerve courses and you know you have a basic understanding of what it innervates, you can just think of putting local anesthetic along various spots along its path and give that a name and there you have it, you have a block. So if you're very close to the dorsal branch, somewhere near the transverse process, and you drop your local anesthetic under the erector spinae muscle, you get the erector spinae plane block. If you are somewhere on the lateral wall and you want to drop the local anesthetic near the lateral branch, you would get both a lateral branch as well as the anterior branch block which is the serratus plane block, especially when you give it under the serratus muscle. There are various other blocks as you come more and more anterior. The PEX2 block will actually cover more of the anterior branch. Very rarely will you be able to get the lateral branch in such a block. And as you come more and more towards the sternum, there are a few sternal blocks that are available, the parasternal block, or the transverse thoracic plane block, which each has its own application. So all these names, though intimidating, uh, are just locations along the course of this nerve where you drop the local anesthetic and create the analgesia. There's some peculiarities of these intercostal nerves. When you're in the thorax, there are typical and atypical intercostal nerves. T3, T4, T5, and T6 are typical intercostal nerves. They are very consistent in the way they are arranged, and they stay confined to their own intercostal space with their corresponding rib above. Now, some of the nerves that are probably, some of them are 
uh, erroneously attributed as intercostal nerves because of the way they are uh, the the way their anatomy is uh, depicted. T1, though it is a thoracic nerve, predominantly behaves like it is it belongs to the brachial plexus. It just does not behave like it's part of uh, the thorax, and the supply of the brachial plexus, especially the ulnar nerve, comes from T1. T2 again is a very peculiar nerve though it supplies some of the thorax. It has a very prominent lateral branch. The branch is so prominent that it has its own name. The lateral branch of the T2 nerve is called the intercostobrachial nerve. You've all heard of it. Further lower down T7 to T10 are again a little unusual. They don't stay confined to their own intercostal space. They often travel very obliquely and supply the abdomen. T7 may have a little bit of overlap into the chest, but it is predominantly uh, an abdominal supply, so they are sometimes called thoracoabdominal nerves. If you'd like to further your knowledge on the anatomy of the intercostal nerves, I would point you to this rather ancient article. Way back in 1932, Davies and colleagues described the anatomy of the intercostal nerves. And what is very interesting is they named a rather unknown entity in today's world. This is the collateral intercostal branch that is present in the same plane as the main intercostal nerve. Now this is a branch that uh, is implicated in persistent pain after thoracotomies, after insertion of intercostal drains. Damage and entrapment of this uh, nerve can be the source of the problem. This nerve is known to supply a bit of the pleura and more of the innermost intercostal muscle. And uh, this is something very interesting that you should all look up in if you want to further your knowledge on the intercostal nerves. Further down, it is seen that the anterior branch actually dips down and lies close to the internal mammary vessels and again close to the transversus thoracis muscle. So if you want to provide analgesia close towards the sternum uh, for sternal fractures or for sternotomies, then this is one of the blocks that has been described, the transversus thoracis muscle block, uh, which is where you would want to deposit the local anesthetic. Whenever you go to the chest or think of providing analgesia for the chest, you need a strategy. As it's pretty much the same thing for every block that we do these days, you need to go in with a plan. You need to understand where the surgery or where the trauma is to provide analgesia for that particular area. So this is just a, a shading of what is possible. It is possible to achieve hemithorax uh, level of analgesia uh, with the current understanding of blocks without having to go into the epidural space. If you want to use the ultrasound very efficiently, you must understand how to image the thoracic spine. But the problem is imaging the spine is a fairly advanced feature. You need a very good ultrasound machine to get some clean images. And uh, you need to have a lot of patience to practice and learn this. Mainly because the thoracic spine is a very compact and a very complex bony structure. And if you've used ultrasound, you know that ultrasound does not pass through bone. There's minimal soft tissue in that area and uh, minimal fluid rich areas, both of which are required to get those beautiful clean ultrasound images. And there are very small openings, unlike the lumbar spine, there are very small openings in the thoracic spine for the ultrasound beam to pass through. And these are further compounded uh, with the fact that these small openings have very steep angles attached to them to access. So if you're trying to put the ultrasound beam through these openings, you'll have to maneuver the probe uh, a fair bit to do so. 
and this again is set against an a rich structure a again is not something that you would like when you are using ultrasound so the lung is set up behind and this makes things difficult when one sets out to image the thoracic spine you must have a very sound understanding of the contours and the shape of the thoracic vertebra you must also remember that there are a lot of limitations when you try to attempt sonography of the thoracic spine and uh, some days you might get a great image some days you may not in most days you may not uh, one of the ways that you can practice and learn the thoracic spine is by practicing on something called water spine phantoms so this is a typical thoracic vertebra uh, it consists of a spinous process a transverse process and a lamina the thoracic spine is very compact and it is these contours formed by the various uh, processes that are on the spine that you need to memorize in a three-dimensional way and be able to identify it when you use the ultrasound so when you look at the thoracic spine with the ultrasound there are different ways of looking at it there are different angles to look at it through and the most common way to start off is by placing the probe transversely on the midline there's you can also place the probe longitudinally in the midline you can place the probe slightly off the midline in a kind of paramedian view just like how you would place a needle for a thoracic epidural in a paramedian manner and this is known as the paramedian oblique sagittal view if you move further lateral and straighten up your probe you can visualize the transverse process this is an important uh, view if you're trying to do the erector spinae plane block if one were to venture out into scanning the thoracic spine the first place you would start would be by placing the probe transversely at the spinous process and trying to get a bit of orientation as to where exactly you are so this is how you would place the probe square on the midline and the beam is likely to go in this manner and what you're trying to image is the spinous process which you see here the lamina and the transverse process so this sort of appearance is very typical of a thoracic vertebra and this is what you should be aiming for with this sort of view if you are trying to do a thoracic epidural it may be useful for marking the midline because you can center the probe you can center the image and do a marking right at the skin and that will depict where the midline is but since we are not talking about the thoracic epidural today we will concentrate on the kind of contours that are created and what can be achieved uh, with this if you turn the probe and place it longitudinally you will be able to identify the spinous processes of two consecutive uh, vertebrae this is not of much use in practice you can use it to identify this space which would be a likely point of insertion of a needle if you're doing uh, any midline intervention like a thoracic epidural but otherwise it's not the most popular of views that we have uh, in the thoracic spine and this is a very important view to have if you move the probe slightly laterally and tilt the probe inwards you try to look at the lamina now the lamina are very characteristic they appear as hyperechoic shadows as you see there with very little information underneath in between the lamina you may see a small dip as well as another hyperechoic structure this is likely to be the ligamentum flavum and this view is actually quite useful if you are thinking of doing a retrolaminar block or you're trying to put in the epidural in a paramedian fashion this is the kind of view that you would want 
The third view is a longitudinal scan at the level of the transverse processes. Now, if you remember how the lamina looked, the lamina looked very flat and hyperechoic. The transverse process appears slightly more curved, ever so slightly more curved. So this view is useful if you're trying to do the erector spinae plane block. Why? Because this muzzle that you see here is the erector spinae and it's very easy to do this sort of imaging and bring the needle and deposit the local anesthetic somewhere in this plane. If you were to move the probe a little bit more laterally, you will see a change in the contours of the bony structure. The bony structures appear to be far more compact now and they appear to be far more rounded. Also, you will begin to see a shimmering, a very alive sort of hyperechoic structure. That is the pleura. These are the ribs. So when you start seeing these sort of more superficial structures, far more rounded, pleura inside, you're likely to be at the ribs. So if you're trying to do those erector spinae blocks and you're a little unsure about where exactly you are, are you at the tip of the transverse process or at the ribs, the pleura is one of the identifying factors at this point. So now that we've learned a little bit about the, the contours of the thoracic spine, uh, we are well qualified to move into imaging the paravertebral space. And the paravertebral block is not anything new because of ultrasound. Many of these old blocks have come out of the closet and are uh, available to us to these days. The block was initially described way back over 100 years ago and uh, somewhere it was reborn in around 1979 with the reappraisal from Eason and Watt. They found it to be very accurate, fairly simple and safe which carried significant advantages over an intercostal or epidural block. But we are interested in ultrasound, we are all ultrasound people. And this was the first description of this block with ultrasound. And have a look at the image here and compare it to what I showed you a while ago and what I'm going to show you. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not sure if any of you can make out the structures. The image is very, very, very difficult to comprehend. But that was the sign of the times 10 years ago. And compared to the wonderful machines that are available to you today, uh, you will, you'll be, I can assure you that if you try the paravertebral block, you will get far more superior images. Now I keep telling you about the gold standard block for the chest, which is the paravertebral block. Now let me tell you why uh, many of us think that this is the gold standard. Uh, to understand this, we need to know the, where the paravertebral space lies and what it contains. Now, if this is a spinous process that you see here, and this is the transverse process. If you go further anteriorly, you will encounter the lung. And there is another entity right beside the transverse process, which is the superior costal transverse ligament. And further laterally, this becomes the internal intercostal membrane. Now, what you see in this diagram is the dorsal branch of the intercostal nerve and the ventral branch of the intercostal nerve. Over here, you might encounter the dorsal root ganglion. Further anterior, you might encounter the thoracic sympathetic chain. Now, the paravertebral space is situated here. It's a wedge-shaped space. It is situated here, and it contains all these bodies. It is essentially uh, half an epidural, an epidural on one side, on the hemithorax. So this is why it is a very interesting point of deposition of the local anesthetic, both for the acute pain physician as well as the chronic pain physician. Apart from these neural structures, 
this area contains the intercostal vessels, the endothoracic fascia and the subserous fascia. The endothoracic fascia is another interesting ent entity when it comes to regional anesthesia and I would urge you to look it up and read about it and how it may impact the paravertebral block. This is how uh, you would look at or you would visually try to recreate the paravertebral space when you're thinking of the spine. This is a posterior to anterior view of the thoracic vertebrae. And what you see here are the superior costotransverse ligaments that you see there. They are just beyond the transverse process. So where the ribs would be and the neural structures. If you look at it from the side, this is where the superior costal transverse ligament is. That is the paravertebral space and just anterior to it lies the lung. So you can understand that if your needle is not precisely placed in this, uh, in this area, the, the likelihood of going through the pleura is imminent. This is another way to look at the paravertebral space. This is a CT section of a thoracic vertebra and that is how it looks. That is where the paravertebral space lies. So what is the paravertebral block? It's just a simple deposition of local anesthetic into the paravertebral space. Uh, in the vicinity of the thoracic spinal nerves, both the dorsal and the ventral branch. And when you do this, a few things might happen. The injectate may remain in that particular paravertebral space. If your volume increases, you may see a spread to the upper and lower paravertebral space. If your volume is large enough, you may even be able to go up to two spaces above and two spaces below. If you're too lateral in terms of your needle tip position, you might see spread happening much more laterally. And this will create a kind of intercostal block, more of a band-like block. Or if your needle is too medial, you might see spread into the epidural space, creating analgesia and anesthesia on the other side. So when you intend to perform a paravertebral block, one must do a transfer scan at the vertebral level that you intend to block. So if you require analgesia around the T4 level, then your scan must precisely be at the T4 thoracic vertebra. And what we would like to image is the spinous process as well as the lamina and the transverse process. The probe is then shifted slightly downwards and we try to image the superior costal transverse ligament. So you, when you do get the ultrasound image, this is the kind of image that you would see. So that is the spinous process over here very clearly. It extends down as the lamina and the transverse process. Now as I had said, the paravertebral space lies in the foothills of the transverse process under the superior costal transverse ligament. So this entity here that you see, it's a usually a hyperechoic line, is the superior costal transverse ligament. Further laterally, it would be the internal intercostal membrane. Around this area, you will also see the shimmering as well as the movement of the pleura. So make sure you do not put your needle in there. So the dark space that you see below the ligament is where the paravertebral space is. If your needle is very lateral, you might wind up with an intercostal block over there. So you aim to get your needle somewhere in this area, very close to the transverse process to get a successful paravertebral block. This is another image of the uh, paravertebral space. This is the lamina. This is the transverse process. What you see here is the superior costal transverse ligament. 
this is the pleura and you're likely to have the paravertebral space somewhere in here. You can also image the paravertebral space in a long axis. Some people like to do the block this way, placing the probe just laterally of the midline and uh, trying to image the paravertebral space. So this is what you would see. You would see the erector spinae muscle there. That would be the trapezius. And this is the pleura. And this is where the ligament is. This is how it would look. And this entity that you see here is the paravertebral space. So that's how it looks if you are doing a transverse view. That is the pleura shimmering over there below. And you can clearly see the paravertebral space. That is the tip of the transverse process. That's the paravertebral space. So it's, an, it's a narrow little space that you'll have to target. A video. I'll show you a video of how we do this. You usually use a high frequency probe a block needle or a 2E needle, about 4 to 5 mils of local anesthetic of your choice per level. Strict asepsis, you can treat this as if this was a central neuraxial block. You can go out of plane or in plane, it just doesn't matter, it just depends on your skill and comfort. The positioning is again up to you, sometimes you do it in sitting, you can do it in prone, you can do it in lateral. This is how I like to do it. I like to carefully map out every single thoracic vertebra so I know exactly where I'm going to be putting the uh, needle in. This is a short video. You can see that the, the movements of the needle coming in out of plane. That's the transverse process here. That's the pleura below and you'll soon see an injection and the pleura dipping down. The pleura dipping down is a very characteristic sign that you're in the right spot and you can see the space expand. So that's how the pleura goes down and the space is expanding. Paravertebral block. So if you are an advanced user, you can follow what Professor Manoj Kamakar, who is an absolute expert in this topic, uh, does he propose to doing a transfer scan at the articular process this allows the needle to actually go much deeper into the paravertebral space now if you look at the current technique that I just showed uh, the needle is actually pretty much lateral in terms of the position in the paravertebral space and this can increase the likelihood of reaching the intercostal space. You don't want the local anesthetic to go lateral. You want it to go more and more medial. So to do that, you need to drive your needle in deeper. But you cannot usually do that because of the acoustic shadow of the transverse process. So once you go close to the transverse process, the needle visualization is very poor. So to improve the needle visualization, we try to get the transverse process out of the way. Now to do that, you need to image the thoracic vertebra. This is how it is. You know the parts by now. That's the spinal cord, the epidural space. And normally the paravertebral space and the intercostal nerves would lie in this area. And as you can see, it is pretty difficult to access because the transverse process is in the way. But if you were to scan a little bit caudal and find the articular process, this is where the articular processes of T6 and T7 are. And you find that now there is a clear path. The transverse process is no longer in the way. So there is an ability for you to reach more medial into the paravertebral space, thereby giving you a much more uh, higher quality blood. So this is how it would look. I know the images suddenly do not seem as appealing. So this is how the articular process would look. It would look like a flat structure. 
this is the internal intercostal membrane and the pleura is over here and this entity is where you would want to bring the needle into for many years now the paravertebral block has been the predominant block for surgical anesthesia for breast surgeries uh, it has been used at various levels uh, in the trunk it has been even used for labor analgesia uh, as well as abdominal surgery when placed bilaterally the stability of the block is phenomenal in my personal experience that if as long as you do not have spread into the epidural space the quality of analgesia as well as the anesthesia is phenomenal something you cannot expect to gain as efficiently with any other block for the of course it is an advanced level block when things go wrong you can create a pneumothorax subarachnoid injection subdural injections epidural spread inadvertently and uh, intravascular spread can happen a little about the intercostal nerve block again these are scans which are fairly lateral in the chest wall you are going away from so when you look at the ultrasound image for the intercostal nerves this is what you are likely to see these are the ribs that you see the muzzle overlying on top will be the serratus anterior you remember i told you that the intercostal nerve lies between three muscles so this will be the external intercostal this will be the internal intercostal and this will be the innermost intercostal and usually at the corner of the rib rise the nerve in association with the corresponding artery and vein in the vein artery nerve arrangement the pleura is seen in green lying below so any this is a real time scan so you can see the pulsations of the vessels the arterial pulsation over there and if you were to bring in a block you would bring in the needle pierce that area and give the drug in this area now coming to something a little more exciting than an intercostal block it is the pectoral blocks and these were described by Dr. Rafael Blanco about eight years ago now. And uh, he first described the first component of it, which was called the PEX1 block, and subsequently described the evolution of it into what was called the PEX2 block. Now, very clearly, the PEX2 block, when you are looking at the intercostals, you are blocking more or less the anterior branches of the intercostal nerve so what is the pex1 block now, there's something i didn't tell you earlier about the innovation of the thorax the pectoral muscles the pectoralis major and the pectoralis minor muscles are supplied by the brachial plexus mainly the lateral pectoral nerve and the medial pectoral nerve Now, if you look under the pectoralis major muscle, which gets reflected in this image, we, we are searching for a vascular structure at the corner, somewhere around here. So, this vascular structure is the pectoral branch of the thoracoacromial artery, and in close vicinity to this vessel lies the lateral pectoral nerve and the medial pectoral nerve. Now you might be wondering why in the image the lateral pectoral nerve is appearing medial and the medial pectoral nerve is appearing lateral. That is because their name originates from the cord from which they arise. So this is how the nerves would look if you were to reflect the pectoralis major. Clearly the nerves lie between the pectoralis major and the pectoralis minor. So when we talk about PEX2 block, we add another component 
to the PEX1 block, that is in addition to blocking the lateral and medial pectoral nerves, we also try to block the anterior branches of the intercostal nerves. So what it would mean is one injection for the pectoral nerves that would happen here and the second injection would be for the intercostal nerves that would happen in that area. So how does the PEX1 look? Well, like I told you, the nerves lie between the pectoralis major muscle and the pectoralis minor muscle. It's very similar to the view you would get when you're performing an infraclavicular block. So between the muscles lie the vascular structures. So it would be just as simple as depositing the local anesthetic along this plane. And that would give you blockade and analgesia of the pectoralis major and minor muscle. So this is a video of how it happens. It's a needle coming in. This is the pectoralis major. That's a pectoralis minor. And we are looking at the fascial plane in between these two muscles. Now, if we were to do a PEX2 block, the area of deposition would be under the pectoralis minor muscle. Now, that would mean placing the probe in a direction towards the axilla and imaging both the pectoralis major and pectoralis minor muscle. One alternative way of doing it is if you get this sort of view, you could just park your needle tip on top of the rib and deliver the local anesthetic. It is often difficult to see the serratus anterior muscle anteriorly. So if you do, it may be just a very thin rim of muscle that you would see. This is how the block would look. That's the pectoralis major and minor muscles that you see, the needle underneath it. You can see the shimmering of the pleura. And the local anesthetic deposition is just above the ribs. You can traverse a long needle down and head more towards uh, the mid axillary line just to enhance the spread. Now, as I said, the pectoral blocks are mainly for very anterior analgesia, but many of us are performing surgeries or analgesia for surgeries that have far more lateral incisions, say like a wide excision for the breast or a thoracotomy. So this would require us to involve the lateral branch of the intercostal nerve. So this, if you remember this image, our zone of depositing the local anesthetic now is more near the mid axillary line and this is where the serratus plane block comes into play. Once again this is something described by Dr. Blanco. So the musculature is slightly different when we go towards the mid axillary line, we are looking at a plane between the latissimus dorsi muscle and the serratus anterior muscle. And that is where we will aim to put the local anesthetic. When we do an ultrasound scan, we are looking at the latissimus dorsi muscle in this manner and the serratus anterior muscle below it. And the neurovascular plane 
along with the thoracodorsal artery lies in between these two muscles right over here. So the local anesthetic deposition would happen in the same plane as the artery which is a good identification point. You can see the pulsations of the artery over there. This is a block being performed. That's the artery right over there. And the local anesthetic being injected above the serratus anterior muscle. One of the controversies that this block brought about was whether to inject above the serratus muscle or below it. Now, we know that one of the ways these blocks work is by the local anesthetic diffusing across planes. So it made sense to be closer to the origins or the original plane of the intercostal nerve, which was far closer if you approached it below the serratus anterior muscle. So a simple injection uh, below the serratus anterior muscle, you can call it the subserratus injection. This is where the latissimus dorsi is, the serratus anterior muscle, the rib. So you'll find that the needle is actually just above the rib and injecting some local anesthetic would lift up this muscle and bring it in a much closer plane to the origins of the intercostal nerve. So this would get you analgesia of the lateral branch as well as the anterior branch. So which one will it be? Should you inject above the serratus muscle or below? They've said that if you inject above the serratus muscle, especially in breast malignancy, that is the same plane that contains the lymph nodes and this might encourage seeding of tumor cells. Injecting deep to the serratus has some added advantage. It does not block the long thoracic and the dorsal scapular nerve. This block has taken on a new name. It's also known as the Brilma block which uh, expands to the block of the lateral branches of the intercostal nerve in the mid axillary line. I would just keep it as deep to the serratus. So what's great about these blocks? It gives extensive hemithorax analgesia from T2 sometimes all the way down to T9. And uh, in the initial studies with Blanco he said that the injections above the serratus may have a noticeably longer duration of action. That could be just one of the only advantages that you see in this block. Well, coming to the flavor of the last two years, the erector spinae plane block. Uh, I will not spend too much time on it because there are over 600 articles on it in PubMed right now. And it is something that has shaken the world of regional anesthesia. You can use the erector spinae block for pretty much anything, though this talk is about chest wall analgesia, so it straight away goes to cardiac surgery, thoracotomy, rib fractures, chronic pain. But off the record, there are people using it for surgeries on the upper limb. They are using it for surgeries on the lower limb. So it is very unique in what it provides. 
So where exactly are we when we do this block? This is the erector spinae muscle and we are injecting the local anesthetic at the tip of the transverse process under the erector spinae muscle. So the erector spinae is actually a group of muscles and what is unique about these muscles is they traverse the entire vertebral column. They arise from as high as C2 and get inserted into the sacrum and this is one of the reasons for the very dynamic spread of the local anesthetic in both. One of the important aspects of this block to keep in mind is that the injection must be done against the tip of the transverse process. So this is how it would look. This is the transverse process that you see here. This is the pleura. This is likely to be the paravertebral space that you see here. And the needle would come in as such and you would expect a local anesthetic fill that would spread both chorad and cephalad. This is another image of the fill attained. This is the needle coming in here and you can see the local anesthetic fluid over here. So there's lots written about the the erector spinae plane block but there is still a lot of gray areas on how it actually works. Now if you were to consider the original theories, the initial postulation was that the superior costal transverse ligament isn't actually a watertight ligament. It's, it's like a piece of cheese, Swiss cheese with holes in it and therefore the local anesthetic would trickle down into the space, cross the ligament and enter the paravertebral space. This was the initial uh, postulation for the erector spinae plane block. And because it was so prolific at spreading towards the head end and the caudate end, uh, the kind of analgesia that it produced was quite vast. But Later studies show that probably it didn't work that way and uh, certain studies have shown that it actually may spread into the epidural space thereby creating a sort of more wholesome sort of analgesia. Uh, Ivanusic and uh, Barrington's study on dye injections in cadavers said that it doesn't go into the paravertebral space and it only stains the dorsal branch of the intercostal nerves in cadavers. Does it go lateral and create a sort of wide band of uh, intercostal analgesia? Not sure about it yet. Or could it just all be going inwards and creating a sort of high intravascular concentration of the drug and creating that, that quite amazing analgesia that it produces. The block works. There's no doubt that the erector spinae block provides some fantastic analgesia, but how it actually works remains a mystery for now. In conclusion, the knowledge of options for chest wall analgesia is very crucial whether you're an acute pain physician or a chronic pain physician. For many people like me, I'm going on about this, the paravertebral is the gold standard for high quality thoracic analgesia. Facial plane blocks work well when they do, but they are very reliant on where you put the local anesthetic and how that local anesthetic spreads within the plane. Careful selection of your block and execution is paramount to consistent success for the analgesia of the trunk. I hope you enjoyed this webinar. Appreciating the painful and historically when you wanted analgesia of the chest you would perhaps go to the most reliable technique placing an epidural catheter but 
you and I know that epidural catheters in the thoracic region can be challenging and are also fraught with complications. So there are some popular ultrasound guided techniques that have emerged in the last couple of years and these make for very good alternatives in providing analgesia to the thorax. When we look to the trunk, it is always very practical to divide it into zones. The uppermost zone is the thorax and the abdomen can be divided into two parts, the upper abdomen and the lower abdomen. Today's lecture we will concentrate on the thorax and maybe we can deal with the abdomen at some other time. It is very important to understand the dermatomal supply of the trunk when we are trying to provide anesthesia and analgesia to this part. If you look at this map, you can see that the predominant supply is from T2 to T6 when we are talking about the thorax. Below that, we are into the zone of the abdomen, which is also actually supplied from nerves that emanate from the thoracic spine. When it comes to providing analgesia for the thorax, there often is a little bit of confusion that goes around. Over the years, the thoracic epidural has been the go-to intervention to provide analgesia for the thorax. Some of the more adventurous and enthusiastic anesthesiologists would try the paravertebral block, sometimes the intercostal blocks. Most of the current techniques that we use these days are very new. In fact, they're not more than 10 years old. Some of the techniques are purely ultrasound based. They're facial plane blocks and some are conversions or interpretations of the landmark technique into ultrasound technique. There's also some reverse engineering that goes on every now and then where these ultrasound guided techniques are being converted to landmark techniques. And of course, we have all faced this. There's a lot of over enthusiasm to name a block these days. And this has resulted in multiple names for the same block, for the same concepts, as well as sometimes the same block being renamed. So in today's webinar, we're going to look at some concepts of thoracic innovation. I believe that once you understand what you're trying to block, the names and the techniques of the blocks should not matter so much. More specifically, we'll go into the paravertebral block in detail. We'll look at the intercostal blocks we look at two blocks that are fairly simple to execute and have gained in popularity for many years now, the pectoral block and the serratus plane block. And we'll also look at that flavor of the season for the last two seasons, if you may, the erector spiny block. Just a little bit on it, not too much. Now, if you're willing to look beyond the thoracic epidural for options for analgesia, you open up a huge bunch of blocks that are available at your disposal in today's practice. Uh, I'm not sure if such a huge list is uh, actually useful or it's intimidating to somebody who's trying to start off in regional anesthesia, but fortunately or unfortunately, this is what we have today. Among the most popular are the pectoral blocks and its evolution, the serratus plane block. Both of these like most of the others are facial plane blocks. They are attributed to their discoverer, Dr. Rafael Blanco. And a further evolution, and the most popular of them these days, is the erector spiny plane block. There are some variations that are close, probably close cousins of the erector spiny plane block, like the mid transverse process to pleura block. Uh, but more or less for traditional regional anesthesiologists like me, the gold standard for thoracic analgesia remains the paravertebral block, which I'll be talking to you about in most of this lecture. Some of the other options are nice to read about, but you'll have to look at it closely and see if that they will suit the kind of practice that you are involved in. Now, if you want to remember just one or two slides from the entire webinar today, 
it would be this one and perhaps the next slide. So it's very important before you decide to put local an anesthetic somewhere that you understand where you're putting it and to what structure are you putting it and what the functional outcome of your act is. So for that you'll have to understand what these nerves are that supply the thorax. So this is representative of a vertebral level and we'll try to describe what a typical thoracic intercostal nerve looks like. So this is the vertebral body that you see there, two transverse processes, a spinous process, and this is the spinal cord that you see there. From the dorsal and the ventral horn emanate the dorsal and ventral branch of the nerve, which together unite to form the spinal nerve. Now on the dorsal branch will lie the dorsal root ganglion. If you're a chronic pain specialist, this is an area of interest for you. And somewhere in the vicinity, we are very close to the sympathetic chain. Now the spinal nerve that comes out throws off an immediate dorsal branch that, uh, that heads towards the erector spinae muscle, goes through it and forms two superficial branches there which supply the skin over the back. But the main nerve is the ventral branch or the anterior branch which courses the entire uh, hemithorax. The ventral branch or the anterior branch somewhere in the middle throws off a lateral branch and this is also of a lot of significance. The lateral branch supplies the skin over the lateral wall of the chest. The anterior branch tends to supply more of the anterior area of the chest. This entire nerve is encased in various layers of muscles and if you were to know the, there are three layers of muscles that the thoracic uh, intercostal nerves is sandwiched in. It is the, this is the external intercostal muscle, this is the internal intercostal muscle, and what you see right here is the innermost intercostal muscle. So the thoracic intercostal nerve actually lies between the internal intercostal muscle and the innermost intercostal muscle. This is very similar to how the neural structures are arranged in the abdomen. Many of you are very familiar with how the tap block is done. You know that the tap block again has three layers of muscles, the external oblique, the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis. And the neural plane is that between the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis. It's a similar concept that you can keep in mind that the plane where the thoracic intercostal nerve lies is between these two muscles, the internal intercostal and the innermost intercostal muscle. So now that you know how this nerve courses and you know you have a basic understanding of what it innervates you can just think of putting local anesthetic along various spots along its path and give that a name and there you have it you have a block so if you're very close to the dorsal branch somewhere near the transverse process and you drop your local anesthetic under the erector spinae muscle you get the erector spinae plane block if you are somewhere on the lateral wall and you want to drop the local anesthetic Near the lateral branch, you would get both a lateral branch as well as the anterior branch block, which is the serratus plane block, especially when you give it under the serratus muscle. There are various other blocks as you come more and more anterior. The PEX2 block will actually cover more of the anterior branch. Very rarely will you be able to get the lateral branch in such a block. And as you come more and more towards the sternum, there are a few sternal blocks that are available, the parasternal block or the transverse thoracic plane block, which each has its own application. So all these names, though intimidating, uh, are just locations along the course of this nerve where you drop the local anesthetic and create the analgesia. 
There's some peculiarities of these intercostal nerves. When you're in the thorax, there are typical and atypical intercostal nerves. T3, T4, T5, and T6 are typical intercostal nerves. They are very consistent in the way they are arranged and they stay confined to their own intercostal space with their corresponding rib above. Now, some of the nerves that are probably, some of them are uh, erroneously attributed as intercostal nerves because of the way they are, uh, the, the way their anatomy is uh, depicted. T1, though it is a thoracic nerve, predominantly behaves like it is it belongs to the brachial plexus it just does not behave like it's part of uh, the thorax and the supply of the brachial plexus especially the ulnar nerve comes from t1 t2 again is a very peculiar nerve though it supplies some of the thorax it has a very prominent lateral branch the branch is so prominent that it has its own name the lateral branch of the T2 nerve is called the intercostobrachial nerve. You've all heard of it. Further lower down, T7 to T10 are again a little unusual. They don't stay confined to their own intercostal space. They often travel very obliquely and supply the abdomen. T7 may have a little bit of overlap into the chest, but it is predominantly uh, an abdominal supply, so they are sometimes called thoracoabdominal nerves. If you'd like to further your knowledge on the anatomy of the intercostal nerves, I would point you to this rather ancient article. Way back in 1932, Davies and colleagues described the anatomy of the intercostal nerves. And what is very interesting is they named a rather unknown entity in today's world. This is the collateral intercostal branch that is present in the same plane as the main intercostal nerve. Now this is a branch that uh, is implicated in persistent pain after thoracotomies, after insertion of intercostal drains, damage and entrapment to this uh, nerve can be the source of the problem. This nerve is known to supply a bit of the pleura and more of the innermost intercostal muscle and uh, this is something very interesting that you should all look up in if you want to further your knowledge on the intercostal nerves. Further down it is seen that the anterior branch actually dips down and lies close to the internal mammary vessels and again close to the transversus thoracis muscle. So if you want to provide analgesia close towards the sternum uh, for sternal fractures or for sternotomies, then this is one of the blocks that has been described, the transversus thoracis muscle block, uh, which is where you would want to deposit the local anesthetic. Whenever you go to the chest or think of providing analgesia for the chest, you need a strategy as it's pretty much the same thing for every block that we do these days you need to go in with a plan you need to understand where the surgery or where the trauma is to provide analgesia for that particular area so this is just a, a shading of what is possible it is possible to achieve hemithorax uh, level of analgesia uh, with the current understanding of blocks without having to go into the epidural space. If you want to use the ultrasound very efficiently, you must understand how to image the thoracic spine. But the problem is, imaging the spine is a fairly advanced feature. You need a very good ultrasound machine to get some clean images and uh, you need to have a lot of patience to practice and learn this mainly because the thoracic spine is a very compact and a very complex bony structure and if you've used ultrasound you know that ultrasound does not pass through bone there's minimal soft tissue in that area 
and uh, minimal fluid rich areas both of which are required to get those beautiful clean ultrasound images and there are very small openings unlike the lumbar spine there are very small openings in the thoracic spine for the ultrasound beam to pass through and these are further compounded uh, with the fact that these small openings have very steep angles attached to them to access so if you're trying to put the ultrasound beam through these openings you'll have to maneuver the probe uh, a fair bit to do so and this again is set against an A-rich structure. A again is not something that you would like when you are using ultrasound. So the lung is set up behind and this makes things difficult. When one sets out to image the thoracic spine, you must have a very sound understanding of the contours and the shape of the thoracic vertebra. You must also remember that there are a lot of limitations when you try to attempt sonography of the thoracic spine and uh, some days you might get a great image some days you may not and most days you may not uh, one of the ways that you can practice and learn the thoracic spine is by practicing on something called water spine phantoms so this is a typical thoracic vertebra uh, it consists of a spinous process, a transverse process, and a lamina. The thoracic spine is very compact, and it is these contours formed by the various uh, processes that are on the spine that you need to memorize in a three-dimensional way and be able to identify it when you use the ultrasound. So when you look at the thoracic spine with the ultrasound, there are different ways of looking at it. There are different angles to look at it through. And the most common way to start off is by placing the probe transversely on the midline. There's, you can also place the probe longitudinally in the midline. You can place the probe slightly off the midline in a kind of paramedian view, just like how you would place a needle for a thoracic epidural in a paramedian manner. And this is known as the paramedian oblique sagittal view. If you move further lateral and straighten up your probe, you can visualize the transverse process. This is an important uh, view if you're trying to do the erector spinae plane block. If one were to venture out into scanning the thoracic spine, the first place you would start would be by placing the probe transversely at the spinous process and trying to get a bit of orientation as to where exactly you are. So this is how you would place the probe square on the midline and the beam is likely to go in this manner and what you're trying to image is the spinous process, which you see here, the lamina, and the transverse process. So this sort of appearance is very typical of a thoracic vertebra, and this is what you should be aiming for. With this sort of view, if you're trying to do a thoracic epidural, it may be useful for marking the midline, because you can center the probe, you can center the image, and do a marking right at the skin, and that will depict where the midline is. But since we are not talking about the thoracic epidural today, we will concentrate on the kind of contours that are created and what can be achieved uh, with this view. If you turn the probe and place it longitudinally, you will be able to identify the spinous processes of two consecutive uh, vertebrae. This is not of much use in practice. You can use it to identify this space, which would be a likely point of insertion of a needle if you're doing uh, any midline intervention like a thoracic epidural. But otherwise, it's not the most popular of views that we have uh, in the thoracic spine. Now, this is a very important view to have. If you move the probe slightly laterally and tilt the probe inwards, you try to look at the lamina. Now, the lamina are very characteristic. 
they appear as hyperechoic shadows as you see there with very little information underneath. In between the lamina you may see a small dip as well as another hyperechoic structure. This is likely to be the ligamentum flavum and this view is actually quite useful if you are thinking of doing a retrolaminar block or you're trying to put in the epidural in a paramedian fashion. This is the kind of view that you would want. The third view is a longitudinal scan at the level of the transverse processes. Now if you remember how the lamina looked, the lamina looked very flat and hyperechoic. The transverse process appears slightly more curved, ever so slightly more curved. So this view is useful if you're trying to do the erector spinae plane block. Why? Because this muzzle that you see here is the erector spinae and it's very easy to do this sort of imaging and bring the needle and deposit the local anesthetic somewhere in this plane. If you were to move the probe a little bit more laterally, you will see a change in the contours of the bony structure. The bony structures appear to be far more compact now and they appear to be far more rounded. Also, you will begin to see a shimmering, a very alive sort of hyperechoic structure. That is the pleura. These are the ribs. So when you start seeing these sort of more superficial structures, far more rounded, pleura inside, you're likely to be at the ribs. So if you're trying to do those erector spinae blocks and you're a little unsure about where exactly you are, are you at the tip of the transverse process or at the ribs, the pleura is one of the identifying factors at this point. So now that we've learned a little bit about the, the contours of the thoracic spine, uh, we are well qualified to move into imaging the paravertebral space. The paravertebral block is not anything new because of ultrasound. Many of these old blocks have come out of the closet and are uh, available to us to these days. The block was initially described way back over 100 years ago and uh, somewhere it was reborn in around 1979 with the reappraisal from Eason and Watt. They found it to be very accurate fairly simple and safe, which carried significant advantages over an intercostal or epidural block. But we are interested in ultrasound. We are all ultrasound people. And this was the first description of this block with ultrasound. And have a look at the image here and compare it to what I showed you a while ago and what I am going to show you. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not sure if any of you can make out the structures. The image is very, very, very difficult to comprehend. But that was the sign of the times 10 years ago. And compared to the wonderful machines that are available to you today, uh, you will, you'll be, I can assure you that if you try the paravertebral block, you will get far more superior images. Now I keep telling you about the gold standard block for the chest, which is the paravertebral block. Now let me tell you why uh, many of us think that this is the gold standard. Uh, to understand this, we need to know the, where the paravertebral space lies and what it contains. Now, if this is a spinous process that you see here, and this is the transverse process. If you go further anteriorly, you will encounter the lung. And there is another entity right beside the transverse process, which is the superior costal transverse ligament. And further laterally, this becomes the internal intercostal membrane. Now, what you see in this diagram is the dorsal branch of the intercostal nerve and the ventral branch of the intercostal nerve. Over here, you might encounter the dorsal root ganglion 
further anterior you might encounter the thoracic sympathetic chain. Now the paravertebral space is situated here. It's a wedge shaped space. It is situated here and it contains all these bodies. It is essentially uh, half an epidural, an epidural on one side on the hemithorax. So this is why it is a very interesting point of deposition of the local anesthetic both for the acute pain physician as well as the chronic pain physician. Apart from these neural structures, this area contains the intercostal vessels, the endothoracic fascia and the subserous fascia. The endothoracic fascia is another interesting ent entity when it comes to regional anesthesia and I would urge you to look it up and read about it and how it may impact the paravertebral block. So this is how uh, you would look at or you would visually try to recreate the paravertebral space when you're thinking of the spine. This is a posterior to anterior view of the thoracic vertebrae and what you see here are the superior costotransverse ligaments that you see there. They are just beyond the transverse process. So where the ribs would be and the neural structures. If you look at it from the side, this is where the superior costal transverse ligament is. That is the paravertebral space and just anterior to it lies the lung. So you can understand that if your needle is not precisely placed in this uh, in this area the the likelihood of going through the pleura is imminent this is another way to look at the paravertebral space this is a ct section of a thoracic vertebra and that is how it looks that is where the paravertebral space lies what is the paravertebral block? It's just a simple deposition of local anesthetic into the paravertebral space uh, in the vicinity of the thoracic spinal nerves, both the dorsal and the ventral branch. And when you do this, a few things might happen. The injectate may remain in that particular paravertebral space. If your volume increases, you may see a spread to the upper and lower paravertebral space. If your volume is large enough, you may even be able to go up to two spaces above and two spaces below. If you're too lateral in terms of your needle tip position, you might see spread happening much more laterally. And this will create a kind of intercostal block, more of a band-like block. Or if your needle is too medial, you might see spread into the epidural space creating analgesia and anesthesia on the other side. So when you intend to perform a paravertebral block, one must do a transfer scan at the vertebral level that you intend to block. So if you require analgesia around the T4 level, then your scan must precisely be at the T4 thoracic vertebra. And what we would like to image is the spinous process as well as the lamina and the transverse process. The probe is then shifted slightly downwards and we try to image the superior costal transverse ligament. So you, when you do get the ultrasound image, this is the kind of image that you would see. So that is the spinous process over here very clearly. It extends down as the lamina and the transverse process. Now, as I had said, the paravertebral space lies in the foothills of the transverse process under the superior costal transverse ligament. So this entity here that you see, it's a usually a hyperechoic line is the superior costal transverse ligament. Further laterally, it would be the internal intercostal membrane. Around this area, you will also see the shimmering as well as the movement of the pleura. So make sure you do not put your needle in there. 
So the dark space that you see below the ligament is where the paravertebral space is. If your needle is very lateral, you might wind up with an intercostal block over there. So you aim to get your needle somewhere in this area, very close to the transverse process to get a successful paravertebral block. This is another image of the uh, paravertebral space. This is the lamina. This is the transverse process. What you see here is the superior costal transverse ligament. This is the pleura. And you're likely to have the paravertebral space somewhere in here. You can also image the paravertebral space in a long axis. Some people like to do the block this way, placing the probe just laterally off the midline and uh, trying to image the paravertebral space. So this is what you would see. You would see the erector spinae muscle there. That would be the trapezius. And this is the pleura. And this is where the ligament is. This is how it would look. And this entity that you see here is the paravertebral space. So that's how it looks if you are doing a transverse view. That is the pleura shimmering over there below. And you can clearly see the paravertebral space. That is the tip of the transverse process. That's the paravertebral space. So it's, an, it's a narrow little space that you'll have to target. A video. I'll show you a video of how we do this. You usually use a high frequency probe, a block needle or a 2E needle. About 4 to 5 mils of local anesthetic of your choice per level. Strict asepsis. You can treat this as if this was a central neuraxial block. You can go out of plane or in plane. It just doesn't matter. It just depends on your skill and comfort. The positioning is, again, up to you. Sometimes you do it in sitting. You can do it in prone. You can do it in lateral. This is how I like to do it. I like to carefully map out every single thoracic vertebra so I know exactly where I'm going to be putting the uh, needle in. This is a short video. You can see that the, the movements of the needle coming in out of plane. That's the transverse process here. That's the pleura below. And you'll soon see an injection and the pleura dipping down. The pleura dipping down is a very characteristic sign that you're in the right spot. And you can see the space expand. So that's how the pleura goes down and the space is expanding paravertebral block. So if you are an advanced user, you can follow what Professor Manoj Kamakar, who is an absolute expert in this topic, uh, does. He proposed to doing a transfer scan at the articular process. This allows the needle to actually go much deeper into the paravertebral space. Now, if you look at the current technique that I just showed, uh, the needle is actually pretty much lateral in terms of the position in the paravertebral space. And this can increase the likelihood of reaching the intercostal space. You don't want the local anesthetic to go lateral. You want it to go more and more medial. So to do that, you need to drive your needle in deeper. But you cannot usually do that because of the acoustic shadow of the transverse process. So once you go close to the transverse process, the needle visualization is very poor. So to improve the needle visualization, we try to get the transverse process out of the way. Now to do that, you need to image the thoracic vertebra. This is how it is. You know the parts by now. That's the spinal cord, the epidural space. And normally, the paravertebral space and the intercostal nerves would lie in this area. And as you can see, it is pretty difficult to access because the transverse process is in the way. 
But if you were to scan a little bit caudal and find the articular process, this is where the articular processes of T6 and T7 are. And you find that now there is a clear path. The transverse process is no longer in the way. So there is an ability for you to reach more medial into the paravertebral space, thereby giving you a much more uh, higher quality blood. So this is how it would look. I know the images suddenly do not seem as appealing. So this is how the articular process would look. It would look like a flat structure. This is the internal intercostal membrane and the pleura is over here. And this entity is where you would want to bring the needle into. For many years now, the paravertebral block has been the predominant block for surgical anesthesia for breast surgeries. Uh, it has been used at various levels uh, in the trunk. It has been even used for labor analgesia uh, as well as abdominal surgery when placed bilaterally. The stability of the block is phenomenal in my personal experience that if as long as you do not have spread into the epidural space, the quality of analgesia as well as the anesthesia is phenomenal, something you cannot expect to gain as efficiently with any other block for the time. Of course, it is an advanced level block. When things go wrong, you can create a pneumothorax subarachnoid injections, subdural injections, epidural spread inadvertently, and uh, intravascular spread can happen. A little about the intercostal nerve block. Again, these are scans which are fairly lateral in the chest wall. You are going away from So when you look at the ultrasound image for the intercostal nerves, this is what you are likely to see these are the ribs that you see the muzzle overlying on top will be the serratus anterior you remember i told you that the intercostal nerve lies between three muscles so this will be the external intercostal this will be the internal intercostal and this will be the innermost intercostal and usually at the corner of the rib rise the nerve in association with the corresponding artery and vein in the vein artery nerve arrangement the pleura is seen in green lying below so any this is a real time scan so you can see the pulsations of the vessels the arterial pulsation over there and if you were to bring in a block you would bring in the needle pierce that area and give the drug in this area. Now coming to something a little more exciting than an intercostal block, it is the pectoral blocks. And these were described by Dr. Rafael Blanco about eight years ago now. And uh, he first described the first component of it, which was called the PEX1 block and subsequently described the evolution of it into what was called the PEX2 block. Now very clearly, the PEX2 block, when you are looking at the intercostals, you are blocking more or less the anterior branches of the intercostal nerve. So what is the PEX1 block? Now there's something I didn't tell you earlier about the innovation of the thorax. The pectoral muscles, the pectoralis major and the pectoralis minor muscles are supplied by the brachial plexus, mainly the lateral pectoral nerve and the medial pectoral nerve. Now, if you look under the pectoralis major muscle, which gets reflected in this image, we, we are searching for a vascular structure at the corner, somewhere around here. So this vascular structure is the pectoral branch of the thoracoacromial artery and in close vicinity to this vessel lies 
the lateral pectoral nerve and the medial pectoral nerve. Now you might be wondering why in the image the lateral pectoral nerve is appearing medial and the medial pectoral nerve is appearing lateral. That is because their name originates from the cord from which they arise. So this is how the nerves would look if you were to reflect the pectoralis major. Clearly, the nerves lie between the pectoralis major and the pectoralis minor. So when we talk about PEX2 block, we add another component uh, to the PEX1 block. That is, in addition to blocking the lateral and medial pectoral nerves, we also try to block the anterior branches of the intercostal nerves. So what it would mean is one injection for the pectoral nerves that would happen here and the second injection would be for the intercostal nerves that would happen in that area. So how does the PEX1 look? Well, like I told you, the nerves lie between the pectoralis major muscle and the pectoralis minor muscle. It's very similar to the view you would get when you're performing an infraclavicular block. So between the muscles lie the vascular structures. So it would be just as simple as depositing the local anesthetic along this plane. And that would give you blockade and analgesia of the pectoralis major and minor muscle. So this is a video of how it happens. It's a needle coming in. This is the pectoralis major, that's the pectoralis minor, and we are looking at the fascial plane in between these two muscles. Now, if we were to do a PEX2 block, the area of deposition would be under the pectoralis minor muscle. Now, that would mean placing the probe in a direction towards the axilla and imaging both the pectoralis major and pectoralis minor muscle. One alternative way of doing it is if you get this sort of view, you could just park your needle tip on top of the rib and deliver the local anesthetic. It is often difficult to see the serratus anterior muscle anteriorly. So if you do, it may be just a very thin rim of muscle that you would see. This is how the block would look. That's a pectoralis major and minor muscles that you see, the needle underneath it. You can see the shimmering of the pleura. And the local anesthetic deposition is just above the ribs. You can traverse a long needle down and head more towards uh, the mid axillary line just to enhance the spread. Now, as I said, the pectoral blocks are mainly for very anterior analgesia. But many of us are performing surgeries, our analgesia for surgeries that have far more lateral incisions, say like a wide excision for the breast or a thoracotomy. So this would require us to involve the lateral branch of the intercostal nerve. So this, if you remember this image, our zone of, of depositing the local anesthetic now is more near the mid axillary line and this is where the serratus plane block comes into play. Once again this is something 
described by Dr. Blanco. So the musculature is slightly different when we go towards the mid axillary line. We are looking at a plane between the latissimus dorsi muscle and the serratus anterior muscle. And that is where we will aim to put the local anesthetic. When we do an ultrasound scan, we are looking at the latissimus dorsi muscle in this manner and the serratus anterior muscle below it and the neurovascular plane along with the thoracodorsal artery lies in between these two muscles right over here. So the local anesthetic deposition would happen in the same plane as the artery which is a good identification point. You can see the pulsations of the artery over there. This is a block being performed. That's the artery right over there. And the local anesthetic being injected above the serratus anterior muscle. One of the controversies that this block brought about was whether to inject above the serratus muscle or below it. Now, we know that one of the ways these blocks work is by the local anesthetic diffusing across planes. So it made sense to be closer to the origins or the original plane of the intercostal nerve, which was far closer if you approached it below the serratus anterior muscle. So a simple injection uh, below the serratus anterior muscle, you can call it the subserratus injection. This is where the latissimus dorsi is, the serratus anterior muscle, the rib. So you'll find that the needle is actually just above the rib and injecting some local anesthetic would lift up this muscle and bring it in a much closer plane to the origins of the intercostal nerve. So this would get you analgesia of the lateral branch as well as the anterior branch. So which one will it be? Should you inject above the serratus muscle or below? They've said that if you inject above the serratus muscle, especially in breast malignancy, that is the same plane that contains the lymph nodes and this might encourage seeding of tumor cells. Injecting deep to the serratus has some added advantage. It does not block the long thoracic and the dorsal scapular nerve. This block has taken on a new name. It's also known as the Brilma block which uh, expands to the block of the lateral branches of the intercostal nerve in the mid axillary line. I would just keep it as deep to the serratus. So what's great about these blocks? It gives extensive hemithorax analgesia from T2 sometimes all the way down to T9 and uh, in the initial studies with Blanco, he said that the injections above the serratus may have a noticeably longer duration of action. That could be just one of the only advantages that you see in this block. Well, coming to the flavor of the last two years, the erector spinae plane block. Uh, I will not spend too much time on it because 
There are over 600 articles on it in PubMed right now and it is something that has shaken the world of regional anesthesia. You can use the erector spinae block for pretty much anything though this talk is about chest wall analgesia so it straight away goes to cardiac surgery, thoracotomy, rib fractures, chronic pain but off the record there are people using it for surgeries on the upper limb they are using it for surgeries on the lower limb so it is very unique in what it provides so where exactly are we when we do this block this is the erector spinae muscle and we are injecting the local anesthetic at the tip of the transverse process under the erector spinae muscle so the erector spinae is actually a group of muscles and what is unique about these muscles is they traverse the entire vertebral column they arise from as high as C2 and get inserted into the sacrum and this is one of the reasons for the very dynamic spread of the local anesthetic in both one of the important aspects of this block to keep in mind is that the injection must be done against the tip of the transverse process. So this is how it would look. This is the transverse process that you see here. This is the pleura. This is likely to be the paravertebral space that you see here. And the needle would come in as such and you would expect a local anesthetic fill that would spread both chorad and cephalad. This is another image of the fill attained. This is the needle coming in here and you can see the local anesthetic fluid over here. So there's lots written about the the erector spinae plane block but there is still a lot of gray areas on how it actually works. Now if you were to consider the original theories, the initial postulation was that the superior costotransverse transverse ligament isn't actually a watertight ligament. It's, it's like a piece of cheese, Swiss cheese with holes in it. And therefore the local anesthetic would trickle down into the space cross the ligament and enter the paravertebral space. This was the initial uh, postulation for the erector spinae plane block. And because it was so prolific at spreading towards the head end and the caudad end, uh, the kind of analgesia that it produced was quite vast. But later studies show that probably it didn't work that way. And uh, Certain studies have shown that it actually may spread into the epidural space, thereby creating a sort of more wholesome sort of analgesia. Uh, Ivanusic and uh, Barrington's study on dye injections in cadavers said that it doesn't go into the paravertebral space and it only stains the dorsal branch of the intercostal nerves in cadavers. Does it go lateral and create a sort of wide band of uh, intercostal analgesia? Not sure about it yet. Or could it just all be going inwards and creating a sort of high intravascular concentration of the drug and creating that, that quite amazing analgesia that it produces? The block work, there's no doubt that the erector spinae block provides some fantastic analgesia, but how it actually works remains a mystery for now. In conclusion, the knowledge of options for chest wall analgesia is very crucial whether you're an acute pain physician or a chronic pain physician. For many people like me, I'm going on about this, the paravertebral is the gold standard for high quality thoracic analgesia. Facial plane blocks work well when they do, 
but they are very reliant on where you put the local anesthetic and how that local anesthetic spreads within the plane. Careful selection of your block and execution is paramount to consistent success for the analgesia of the trunk. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this webinar. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Amjad, for that excellent uh, presentation. As usual, your slides were more colorful, and uh, the slides were really, really good, and uh, the animation was fantastic. Uh, I hope all the participants have enjoyed it uh, uh, thoroughly. And uh, now we'll move to the Q and A uh, session. Uh, we have uh, quite a few questions uh, coming from the participants. Uh, before that, I would like to ask uh, one question from uh, my side on behalf of all the participants. So why, why do you would consider uh, the paravertebral block as the gold standard next to the epidural, thoracic epidural block? Is it because it is uh, it, it blocks the uh, intercostal nerve or the, uh, the, the thoracic spinal nerve at its root level or because it blocks both the uh, sympathetic as well as somatic component. Yeah, most of the surgeries that we encounter as a non-cardiac anesthesiologist involve one side of the chest. So when you put in an epidural, you are giving a complementary analgesia to the other side of the chest where there is nothing that you need to anesthetize. So the component of the paravertebral that is of most importance is the effect is unilateral. Uh, so this creates about half of the hemodynamics response that an epidural might create. And you have a much more stable block going. Of course, whenever you put a nerve, a local anesthetic very proximal in the course of the nerve, you get analgesia along the entire course of the rest of the nerve, extending distally. So the paravertebral is the next most proximal area in the course of the nerve to place the local anesthetic. Of course, for chronic pain applications, the access the, or the likely access to the dorsal root ganglion and the sympathetic chain may be advantageous to the chronic pain people. Uh, the other added advantage, again, it's something similar with the epidural is that you may get spread upwards and downwards. So unlike an intercostal nerve block, you get maybe two levels above, two levels below. And this, again, could give a more wider band of analgesia, which is often desired because sometimes the incisions are not limited to a single dermatome. Okay. So we'll take questions from the, from the audience. We have a first question from uh, uh, Gheem Hack. So he has asked the question that if the pleura is punctured during the uh, paravertebral block puncture process, what rescue measures should be taken? Yeah. So, so he's asking mainly how yeah. to tackle the complication. Yeah. So there are a couple of things. If you're doing the block awake, so I'm a person who does the block under anesthesia as well as awake, depending on the situation. So if you're doing the block awake, one of the characteristic signs that you're touching the pleura is the patient may cough. You must always remember the needle rubbing against the pleura is highly irritating. The patient may cough. So that is the first warning sign that you just pull back your needle. Don't advance it any more then. If you're using these small needles, your risk of pneumothorax is always there, but it is probably not as uh, great as it is made out to be. Uh, you would want to keep an eye on such a patient if you have suspected a pleural puncture. If you're doing the block under anesthesia, what we tend to do is we, uh, usually the patient would be paralyzed. So what we tend to do is we tend to take the patient off the ventilator. So you have a very still pleura uh, so that the pleural movement doesn't interfere with the needle entering there. Of course, uh, you have to keep an eye on the needle tip as much as you can. Do not advance if you're unsure where your needle is. Uh, and, uh, of course, needle visualization is paramount. 
to what you do. There's another little thing that I do when I do the paravertebral block is to feel for the kind of feedback the needle gives. So as you go past the superior costal transverse ligament, you feel a kind of rubbery give. It's very characteristic. So even if you're not seeing the needle, you probably, when you get that feeling, you realize that you're inside and you can inject a little bit of the local anesthetic or saline to check where you are. Okay. So you, you, you would recommend this, uh, you would consider this uh, ultrasound guided uh, paravertebral block as an entry level block for the uh, uh, anesthesiologist or it's an expert level, advanced level of uh, block. Yeah, I would say it is an intermediate to advanced level block. One is the imaging can sometimes be challenging if the patient is large. The needling can be difficult. The pleura is right in front of you, millimeters away from your needle. So you should have some amount of competency. I would say it is an intermediate to advanced level block. Again, even with uh, a lot of advanced users, it's a, it's a great block, but there are not too many people that I know who actually use it in their everyday practice. So again, it's a bit of a rare entity. Definitely have some competency before you venture into this block. Okay. So uh, uh, what precautions can we take to avoid uh, the pleural puncture? Uh, technical aspect, for example, sitting versus a uh, uh, lying down patient in plane or out of plane approach where we can see the needle path in, in plane approach uh, a, a, any any other uh, suggestions to reduce the complication rather than after you uh, you encounter a complication and try to manage it so any any, any tips you can uh, give us yeah so uh, in plane or out of plane doesn't matter it depends on your competency what you're comfortable with the position also does not matter. Nothing actually changes in terms of the anatomical position, if whether the patient is sitting or lying down in lateral, that doesn't matter. Then you look at things which are very consistent in regional anesthesia in terms of safety, good needle imaging. Uh, you, what, you would probably, because it's, it can become a deep block, you would want to inject little bits of saline. Don't take your local anesthetic yet just connect a syringe of five mils of saline or 10 mils of saline. And if you feel lost with your needling, just inject a little bit and you'll be able to see which plane you're in and then advance further. But it's paramount, again, not just for paravertebral. It, I say this for every block. You must know where your needle tip is. Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, why the paravertebral block is not very popular is uh, probably it has to be done at multiple levels. And it's very cumbersome to do at each level. It's not like you do at one level and it's done. Uh, unlike a thoracic epidural, you do it at one level and you put a catheter and it's done. Uh, Paravertebral block has to be done at each and every level for to provide a surgical anesthesia or even analgesia. So we'll take the next question. Uh, uh, this is by Alex Windeel. Uh, great lecture. Thank you, Dr. Amja. Uh, what concentration and amount of drug do you usually use for regional anesthesia block like breast surgery? He's asking okay. the concentration and amount of the drug. Okay, so uh, if you're going to be using it for surgical anesthesia, there's a different drug concentration. And if you're using it for analgesia, if you're placed in a catheter, then the concentrations are different. Most of us in our practice use rapivacaine and we consider equivalencies of the same drug in when, if when you're using bupivacaine. So if it's ropivacaine, if you want to get surgical anesthesia, suppose you're trying to do the entire surgery under a paravertebral multiple level block, you will put in about four or five ml per level. If you were to, if you're targeting some amount of spread or you've placed a catheter, your initial bolus would be about 15 to 20 mils so that it traverses a few spaces above and below. So those are the kind of volumes per level you would be looking at about 4 to 5 ml to create a uh, block. Concentrations can be 0.5% ropivacaine uh, for surgical anesthesia or maybe a little more if you want or 0.375% ropivacaine. Those are personal choices. 0.2% uh, rapivacaine or 0.1% bupivacaine for 
analgesia or for infusions later on. But uh, then again, you must make sure you are well within the toxic dose of that particular drug. So again, it depends on the body weight. If you're doing this in pediatrics, it's diff- going to be different volumes and uh, adults. So the best way is to look at the body weight and then calculate. Because this is close to the intercostal space, you know that the intercostal and the epidural space are the two areas where the LA uptake is very high. So you must be very careful in titrating your dose and being exact about things. Thank you, Dr. Amjad. Uh, the next question is from uh, Jax Rohm. Uh, Hi, doctor. For breast surgery, if the needle tip display is not clearly visible, how to judge the depth of the needle puncture? I think this question has been already answered uh, by probably, injecting probably saline. A little, bit, a little bit of saline injections just to make sure where you are every now and then. Okay. Okay. Uh, one one question from my side. Uh, you, you told something about the collateral branch of the intercostal nerve uh, during your uh, lecture. So okay, can you throw some more light about that branch? So uh, usually the, the traditional teaching is that uh, in the intercostal space between the internal intercostal and the innermost intercostal, the arrangement of the neurovascular structure is vein, artery and the nerve uh, just beneath the uh, corresponding rib. Uh, so, so, uh, so, what about this collateral branch? Where does it run, and what's its importance? So, there's very little about it. Uh, like I said, there are probably just two articles that I encountered about it. But uh, they hold this collateral branch responsible for a lot of the post-procedural pains that uh, maybe you, as a chronic physician, see. Uh, the in terms of location, it is in the same plane, but it appears to be a separate entity, not attached to the anterior branch of the complete intercostal nerve as it travels through the intercostal space. Uh, unfortunately, the, the kind of, uh, uh, this isn't anatomy that is very commonly seen. If you look at many of the textbooks, they don't, they don't depict this branch at all. But like I said, in that 1932 paper, it's there. There's another paper which has something about it. It's quite interesting to note. They also tell you that uh, because of this branch, the surgeons need to be very careful of how they commit their incision because this is very closely uh, associated with the trauma. Uh, something that we, we can all probably you know, read about and try to figure out if it really is important in our practice. Unfortunately, there's not that much knowledge about it available to us. Okay. So hopefully we get more articles on this nerve in future. Uh, next question, moving on to the next question by Olga and Olga Music. Can the second to ninth rib fracture uh, be, an, uh, in, the, in the second to ninth rib fractures, can the intercostal nerve block be considered or any other methods to be had? What is the effect of serratus anterior plane block for rib fracture, second to ninth rib fracture? Okay. So if you were going to do an intercostal nerve block, you would have to do it at every single level. And then when it wears off, you have to turn the patient to it every single level. You have to keep doing it for days. I, I wouldn't recommend an intercostal nerve block uh, for rib fractures. Mainly one is because multiple levels next to the duration of the block, it's not a location where you can place a catheter. So straight away, when you have a rib fracture, you're looking at a few days of analgesia. So it's catheter time. So there are a few things that you can do, starting from right from the back, you can do a thoracic epidural. Your next option is a paravertebral. But with both these techniques, don't expect it to span the entire T2 to T9. That's, it's a very vast area. Of course, the new believers will tell you, we'll just do an erector spinae plane block. That might work. The spread is more prolific, caudal and cephaloid with an erector spinae. So that is a, a very good option that you might have there. The serratus plane block deals with analgesia somewhere around where the lateral branch of the intercostal nerve is. So you're looking at analgesia, the mid axillary line, and more anterior. So if the rib fractures are posterior, the serratus block may or may not work. It again depends on spread. 
And uh, when, when you're dependent on spread, there's a lot of compromise that one has to make. So if you ask me rib fractures, three options, paravertebral, the epidural, or the rectospinal plane block. Those tend to make a little bit of sense based on the spread that you're trying to attain for such a vast level. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I would uh, echo Dr. Amjad's words here because uh, if you have a bilateral, multiple rib fractures, extensive bilateral rib fracture, I think it's better to go for an epidural uh, rather than a paravertebral or intercostal nerve block. And uh, one question from Mitre again, uh, I, I, in, in case of uh, multiple rib fracture, like extensive from uh, second rib to ninth rib, I don't think uh, analgesia is required for the upper rib fractures because they are uh, almost uh, immobile. Only the lower ribs are the one which tend to move with the respiration and cause a lot of pain, causing uh, restriction of the respiration. If you can uh, uh, cover the lower uh, ribs from T5 maybe to T9, that should be sufficient to cause uh, analgesia and improve the vital capacity of the patient. And uh, one more question here I would like to ask. You told that anterior cutaneous branches are also blocked in case of a uh, serratus anterior plane block if you deposit the local anesthetic deep to serratus anterior muscle. Uh, but still, the local anesthetic has to travel or it has to uh, pass through the external intercostal muscle, internal intercostal muscle, the two important muscles, their fascia and a lot of things. Uh, does the anterior cutaneous nerves consistently block with subserratus injection or only the lateral branches that are blocked with the subserratus injection? So for sure, whether you put the local anesthetic below the serratus or above the serratus, you should be able to block the lateral cutaneous nerve because the lateral cutaneous nerve somewhere, you know, around the mid axial line starts heading outwards almost vertically. And sometimes you can uh, scan and actually see this nerve leaving. As for the anterior cutaneous nerve, one of the ways the, these blocks tend to work is through diffusion through muscles. Now, unlike abdominal muscles, the intercostal, the external intercostal and the internal intercostal are really thin. So the local anesthetic can diffuse through quite well. And uh, if anything, it is seen in the clinical effect that you get after doing this block. The blocks do work. They definitely do work. Uh, the diffusion has always been touted as one of the ways where uh, how these blocks work. So definitely because they're really thin, they're really small muscles, it should be uh, quite effective there. Okay. Uh, one more question. Uh, in case of pectoralis 2, pec 2 block, where we inject between the pec minor and uh, serratus anterior muscle, uh, so what number of the thoracic nerves are blocked. Apart from uh, the long thoracic and uh, thoracodorsal, how many intercostal or how many thoracic segments can be blocked with PEC2 block? Yeah, so again, with a facial peeling in block, uh, it just depends on how well the local anesthetic spreads. Uh, how it spreads, we have no control about. Uh, how much it spreads, we have no control about. What I try to do is whenever the patient is quite small in size and the quite thin, I try to start as high as possible. That is the second rib, but most of the time it is the third rib where the initial injection starts. And I tend to use a 150 millimeter needle. That's a very, very big needle. And I start pushing the needle in a very flat plane after initially dis uh, dissecting open the plane. I start pushing the needle in and try to go to the third rib, fourth rib, fifth rib, as far down as I can go. So if I, for a breast surgery and pecs pretty much, you're limited to breast surgeries and, uh, you know, things like that. So if I'm able to cover about T3, T4, T5, I've got a, a fair bit of analgesia going for a breast surgery. So pretty much uh, that is the zone where I will... I will want to ensure my analgesia is whether it spreads further down. Of course, it is in the plane. It can spread further down. It can go T60. So depending again on the volume, the kind of dynamics that fluid has shown, it can go lower down. But uh, what you would reliably want to expect is something from 
to T2, T3, to about T5, T6. That's that's pretty much nails it for the PEX2. Okay. And uh, what's your opinion uh, on uh, uh, PEX2 block uh, as a sole anesthetic agent for some of the surgeries like uh, a small breast lump excision, the lateral quadrant of the breast, with the, or a sentinel node biopsies? Okay, so there are a few people I know who like to do these facial plane blocks or surgical anesthesia. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not one of them because once again, when you do regional anesthesia for anesthesia, you want a very predictable block. You don't want your block failing. It, it doesn't look good. It's not good for you. It's not good for uh, the patient. It's not good for regional anesthesia as a whole. So when you have a block that is dependent on volume and time, unlike a, a very targeted sort of nerve block like in the brachial plexus, then you're leaving a lot of things to chance. Yes, it is possible. It's not something that I do. It is possible. You'll have to ensure that sufficient time is given for the block to act. Uh, sufficient concentration is given. There should be as much as possible, very intentional deposition in the key areas. So there are a lot of things that complicate this. I tend to stay away from these blocks for surgical anesthesia in keeping in view the, you know, the complete patient experience. Uh, but yes, some people do do it, but I'm not one of those. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll move on to the next question. This question is by uh, Putra Samera Jaya. Do you always use epinephrine as adjuvant for thoracic paravertebral blocks? Okay. I do not use personally, this is a personal opinion. Uh, there are a lot of adjuvants used in regional anesthesia. Epinephrine is one of them. There are several others. I am one who does not use any adjuvant in my regional anesthetic practice. Uh, the reason being, you want your block to be predictable. Either you want to try to control the duration of the block, the onset of the block, everything needs to be predictable. So by adding adjuncts, you complicate things a little bit. We don't know whether the adjuncts actually work uh, specifically on that area or they have a systemic effect. We don't know these things for sure yet. As for epinephrine, the only use for epinephrine in, uh, I would say, which is quite logical, is to use it in areas where you expect very high uptake of the local anesthetic. That is, if you're using it in one of these chest wall blocks, which is close to the intercostals, and you're depositing large volumes of local anesthetic, you can use the epinephrine to theoretically slow down the uptake into the blood. But in terms of extending duration, uh, hastening onset, uh, I'm not a big fan of using this. Uh, as well as for an indicator, I think a vascular indicator, I think... Some of us use it still for the epidural, but beyond that, I do not use any uh, adjuvants to the local anesthetic or additives. Okay. Uh, next question is from Smriti Ja, our friend. Uh, in case of rib fracture, uh, the fracture can be posterior, anterolateral, or anterior rib fracture. So intercostal nerve supplies the rib. So her question is very, very uh, clear and very nice question she, she has asked. The nerve supply to the rib, uh, is it a single nerve uh, which is given off from the intercostal nerve that supplies the whole of the rib or the branches, multiple branches are given at multiple levels throughout the course of the uh, intercostal nerve? That's the first question she has asked. And second question, does your strategy for rib fracture depend on the site of the fracture? Hope you got the question. Yeah, I got it. It's a very nice question. If you look at uh, many of the illustrations that are available in the textbooks from from Gray's in you know a century ago, they do not draw those little little branches that you expect to reach the osteotome. But at a small level, at a at a you know I wouldn't say microscopic, at a very minimal level, you would expect the the main trunk of the nerve to throw off uh, certain branches. These particularly cannot be seen under, under ultrasound. You would expect them to be there, but uh, I think unless you do a really, really minute cadaveric dissection, you may see them there. Uh, 
I think the second question, Ram, what was that? Second, uh, second question is: yeah. uh, does, does your strategy depend upon the site of fracture? Yeah. So the strategy in all of regional anesthesia is to put the local anesthetic proximal to the area that you want to block. So if the fracture is very, very, very much posterior, then you would want to go more towards the midline, towards the central neural axis. If it goes a little bit towards the anterior side, then you want to come a little bit back and drop the anesthetic there. Uh, that is pretty much the strategy for everything that we do. So it holds good for rib fractures also. Okay. Uh, thank you, Smriti, for the asking a nice question there. Uh, we'll move on to the next question by Lily. Excuse me, uh, the time is almost uh, up. Oh, okay. I think okay. we can answer one more question, okay? Then we okay. can... Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, last question uh, by the by the participant. For fixed rate continuous infusion through elastometric pumps, for example, easy pump, what volume would you recommend for paravertebral, erector spinae, and serratus spline block? Okay, for a continuous catheter, what sort of infusions? Yeah. I think paravertebral, the, the thing with these infusions is there isn't any science to it. Uh, there are people who use five mils, three mils for certain blocks. They go up to 12 mils for even femoral nerve blocks. I think a couple of years ago, there were papers showing that people were running it as much as 12 ml per hour. So what we do these days is to actually, when you, when you have a little bit of doubt, we use patient control boluses. So we use the local anesthetic through uh, PCA pumps. So patients can bolus themselves if you get the infusion wrong. But if you're using an elastometric pump, then you have uh, pretty much fixed rates sometimes, and you have some of the multimetric pumps that go up. Paravertebral, probably five mils per hour. That would be how uh, it would be. With the erector spinae, again, it's a little variable because the local anesthetic tends to spread very, very prolifically up and down. You would want slightly more volume. So when you do that, you tend to reduce the concentration. So instead of using point to Rapivacaine, you would probably want to increase the volumes and drop down the concentration to 0.15 or 0.1. Serratus plane block, again, uh, pretty much limited. You're limited to a very small area. So if you're putting a catheter there, again, you're looking at, again, somewhere in the 5 to 7 ml range. Uh, but it's always better in today's practice to use these patient-controlled pumps and keep a very basal minimal rate and allow the patient to bolus themselves with, say, a 5 or a 10 ml bolus and then lock the pump out for a couple of hours and then study this and see if the catheter position is optimal. If you have a very frequent bolusing pattern, then you probably want to up your infusion and uh, then relook the cat. So most of my catheters, wherever they are in the body, are sit, they usually travel at about 5 ml per hour. Sometimes they go up to 7, but... I don't see a reason to put more than 7 ml per hour. That's a little overkill in terms of flooding. Then you start having catheter leaks. All those sort of problems start happening. So try to keep your catheter placement very, very accurate. So if your catheter is placed accurately at the site, then your local anesthetic volume infusion rates come down significantly. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amjad. That was a very, very well uh, um, uh, explained uh, in, in terms of uh, the catheters and infusion rates. Uh, I, I think we should, uh, the time is up and we have to end the session now. Uh, I hope all the participants uh, enjoyed the session nicely and thoroughly and hope it will bring a change in their practice after this uh, uh, lecture. Uh, I would like to thank Mr. Audi for uh, providing us the opportunity to conduct this uh, webinar. Uh, over to Mr. Audi. Yes, uh, thank you so much again, Dr. Amjad, for your wonderful presentation. And also thanks so much for your, for Dr. Ramuti for your great assistance. It's very thank you. Nice. So, you know, it's time is up. So we have to say goodbye now. And also, thanks so much for all the audiences for staying with us all the time. Uh, for more information about Wisonic uh, forthcoming new webinars or the replay of the previous 
webinars. Welcome to follow with Sonic official account at Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube. Thank you. See you next time. Bye bye. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.